in this fourth lesson of the credit recovery third unit, you're going to notice that all the different learning that we just got done talking about in lesson one, lesson two, and lesson three are all going to now set up unit four. Okay, so this is going to be over the Crusades, and I have one slide in particular that I'm going to have you pay extra close attention to when we get there. But the reason why cultural advancement happens is going to be because of the Crusades, okay, and especially in future of world history units, I guess, if you need to do the second quarter of this. But in this, I want you to notice that this could also be a human-made catastrophe, okay? And reason being is that it's going to be wars. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to die. So getting into this one in particular, identify and explain the consequences of the Crusades that they had on trade specifically. And if you want to go human migration, you can. But getting right into it. So setting the scene, we're right around the year 1100. The Muslims are taking over a good chunk of the Middle East. And in that time, they're taking over Jerusalem. So we talked about in past lessons where Jerusalem is a sacred city for the Catholic or the um, Christians because that's where Jesus was crucified. Okay, so that's kind of be perspective number one. So keep that in mind. But then... The Muslims want control of Jerusalem because that's where Muhammad got all of his information that makes up the Islamic faith. So again, both of them want to be able to control it. And since one is mean to the other one, you're also going to notice that they're going to come to blows. Okay, So if you balance both of these perspectives, you're going to understand why the Crusades were such a big deal. Okay, So it is a series of wars over the Holy Land, spe specifically over control of Jerusalem. And as I record this in 2022, there is no solution to this. It is still an absolute mess over there. So here's how it started. So Christians from Europe would want to go down and visit the place where Jesus was crucified. Well, a group of Muslims did not really like them invading into their turf, so they would constantly harass them and to the point where they would eventually kill them. So the Pope of the time did not like this, so he goes around to all the different Western European countries that are Christian and says, we need to basically rally up and we need to go and make sure that we can able to go down there if we need to, or we should be able to have passage to the Holy Land. So as jacked up as it sounds, the Pope encouraged war. So I know it kind of goes against a lot of faith stuff. But again, say no more. The Pope says you do something, you go and you do something. So you're going to notice, first question, the Crusades were a series of religious wars for the control of which city? All right, so again, balancing these perspectives, again, if you understand why Jerusalem is such a holy city for both faiths, you're going to be good. But when it gets down into the fighting back and forth, you're going to notice that a lot of people from Europe answered this call. Because remember, the religion is at the center of people's lives. And the Pope says something, you do it. So crusaders, Europeans, go went down there. They won the war, the first war, the first crusade, if you will. But here's the problem. None of these people want to live in the Middle East or live into Jerusalem and like protect it. So after they won, a lot of them go back home to Europe, leaving some people in control of Jerusalem that are Christian, which basically led to the second crusade. And it was very easy for the Islamic people to take it back over because there just wasn't a whole lot of numbers. But the first crusade was an absolute bloodbath. I mean, there was just so much death and destruction that it really was a shame that it happened in one of the most holy cities in the world. So that sets up the third crusade, saying we need to come back, we need to take it back over. And you're going to notice that three countries are actually going to answer the call again to go and reclaim. Okay, you're going to have Richard the Lionheart of England. You are going to have Feb Frederick Barbarossa of Germany and King Philip of France. So Christian, Christian, Christian time or Christian faiths at this time. So all of them believe in God and so on and so forth. They have a problem. On the other side during this time is the Muslim general, for lack of a better term, of Saladin or Saladin, if you want to. During this time, he is one of the top military minds, and these three are going to have their work cut out for him. So they have to go, and they have to actually go to the Middle East, just like we just got done talking about. But getting there was a problem, okay? So on the way, you're going to notice that Germany 
is going to drop out right away because Frederick Barbarossa, he dies on the boat ride to Jerusalem. So Germany and their soldiers say, hey, we got to dip out. We got to go back to Germany and kind of get our crap back together. Philip II backs out even before he even reached there. So nobody really knows why. And if somebody does know why, they have more of a history background than I do. But simply put, he just turned around and does what France does, and they gave up. So with no France and no Germany, only one was left. And who was it? Which country and leader was left from Europe for the Third Crusade? So when Richard the Lionheart, the lone survivor of leaving Europe, going to Jerusalem to go and find, shows up, he is going to be very outmanned and very outmatched. Now, here is where the interesting thing comes in. Saladin is actually going to admire like his tenacity. Basically, he respects the fact that he has guts and that he's going to show up and still try to fight. So they do a little bit of fighting, and they kind of have a standstill, I guess you would say. But eventually, the Europeans, the England people from England, they're eventually going to get tired, hurt, and they're going to basically look for some sort of treaty. So since the two leaders had such respect for one another, they're sending messages back and forth negotiating this treaty. And Saladin agrees to let Christians enter into Jerusalem as long as they do not have any sort of weaponry. So meaning... Muslim soldiers are going to be on the outskirts of Jerusalem. They check in their weapons. The Christians check in their weapons with them. They go do their you know, Christian thing, go worship the ground that Jesus walked on or was crucified, whichever. And then they come back, get their weapons, and they dip out. All the while, Jerusalem remains under the control of Jerusalem. So this is a pretty decent like treaty. However, it didn't last forever, unfortunately. But again, the story of Richard and the Lionheart is pretty legendary, if you will. So here's where they just keep coming. So there's a fourth crusade, there's a fifth crusade, there's a sixth, there's a seventh. And if you want to look at them more in depth, you can. I'm going to tell you like the easy way to remember all of them here in a little bit. And there's an eighth, there's a ninth, and there's a tenth. There's actually even a children's crusade that I didn't even include. But side note, the Knights Templar of National Treasure, if you've ever seen that movie, this is in the Ninth Crusade is one that actually all started about. And if you keep in mind of all the different things that are happening in Europe, this is setting up the effects of the Crusades, if you will. But when it was all said and done, the Crusades ended. Muslims still had control of Jerusalem. Christians did not have any sort of control in it. And it fast forwarded to the 50s, 1950s, where what's known as the Persians, I guess who is it? Not the Persians. I can't remember the name off the top of my head having a brain cramp on the moment. But anyways, where you're going to notice that people of the Muslim faith and people of the Jewish faith are going to start button heads because of um, how they think the Muslims have the control of this area because of this time. All right, so here are the effects. And again, this is the main event, if you will. So because of all the different uh, wars that are happening, two to six million people are dying Okay, in all these crusades. This also brought about the end of feudalism because all these people going off and fighting the wars, if you will, were leaving their feudal contracts. So some people didn't come home. But most importantly, all the culture that you just learned about in Lesson 3 is actually making its way back up to Europe. And this is what's going to launch the Renaissance. So all the scientific discoveries, all the paintings, all the colors, the basically a technology, if you will, is going to kickstart the Renaissance. And if you have to do the second quarter of this, you're going to hear all about it. So again, the Muslim culture being as advanced as what it was is what kind of kickstarted the European culture again, which is a good deal. But here's the last question, true or false? The Crusades inadvertently caused the Renaissance in Europe. 